Hi there. Let's talk about graphic narratives. In this lecture, we're going to look at manga after World War II as it grew into a major worldwide phenomenon. And the forces that it shaped what we know as manga today. To begin with, manga really always has been a very male-dominated art form. Men and boys can make up the vast majority of the readership of manga. I see that as the most popular manga magazine, Show and Jump, comes out weekly, sometimes 21 stories serialized with all the big name titles, Naruto, One Piece, and uh, the big seller today is Jujutsu Kaitsen, with over 12 million copies sold. So this is just a staggeringly popular medium that way outshines anything that is produced in the United States. Manga readership is used very significantly toward men. You can see here in this pie chart, and you can see the, the large portions of the pie are the boys and men's manga whereas women and girls' manga, shoujo and ridusu, make up less than 20% of the total. And yet women play a very key role, both in shaping and developing what we know of as manga today. One of the ways you can see that influence of women is this idea that's very commonly found in Japanese culture which is really cultivated through a lot of ideas that occurred in shoujo manga, girls' manga, the idea of cute. Cute, or kawaii, as it's called in Japan, is an idea which is very different from the Western idea of cute. Cute is not just adorable and sweet and maybe even cloyingly sweet, but there is something very general and almost nondescript. The great story is when they tried to sell Barbie in Japan, which is sort of the quintessential cute figure of an American girl. They found it really didn't sell very well. She was too much a person, and her features were too distinctive. And so what cute, for something to be identified as cute, it needs to be more generic. It needs to be less specific. That's one of the ideas about cute that has come and been cultivated in the modern era. If we look back into the distant past, the Japanese idea of cute is not that different from the way we think of cute today in the United States. But in the modern era, the word cute has really expanded and changed into a really interesting idea, and it's largely due to girls' manga. Now, here's an example from the Artists' Clamp, a women collective, and they made a one-off comic called The One I Love, where a pair of high school friends are talking about what it means to be cute. Cute, he says, is just too vague. He says, okay, well, that manhole's cute, that bird's cute, the flower's cute. And he says, well, you think the manhole is cute? And he says, I do. You know, you can say a manhole is cute. It's not that strange, but it's strange to call something like that beautiful. And this distinction between beauty and cute is a very important distinction that's made in girls' manga quite a bit. And so when he says to her, I think you're cute, then she just kind of loses it. And this is one of the typical conventions of girls' manga is that when a character is feeling younger, suddenly their appearance, they become more and more childlike. And you can see that transformation when she first emotionally overwrought by him calling her cute. She first appears as a young girl, and then two panels later, she restores back to her teenage self. And this is sort of the way in which this vocabulary of manga is just so 
rich and varied. It really speaks to a lot of the emotional dynamics of teenagers. So when we talk about manga in general, we think about what goes into a manga. One of the things I is really important to point out before we go too far into that is just how incredibly varied the stories of manga are. And there's all kinds of mix-ups of genres, science fiction and comp, science fiction, fantasy, romance, normal life and cooking, baseball and romance, detectives and the paranormal, war and romance, video games and fantasy, humor and action adventure. This mix-up of genres is one of the features of early manga that is carried on and expanded, and that it appeals to this enormous range of audiences. No matter who you are, no matter what age you are, there is a manga that you will find captivates you and engages you and, and speaks to you. And, and that's because it's really not that interested in intellectual properties such as superheroes you know, that, you know, are the sort of mainstay of American comics. And we'll talk more about that later. Here's an example, Dobutsu no Aoi Hasan by Noriku Sasaki was a very popular manga about a, a nurse who has a pet husky. And when this was, was all the rage, huskies as pets became all the rage. Manga does a lot to explore all kinds of genres in different ways. Here's a comic, Walking Man by Jiro Tanaguchi. Some of you may have read this earlier. And it's really very spare. Uh, it's, it's, it's realistic, and it's very slice of life. And we look at the way in which a man is going for a walk, and that's really the whole subject of it. It's this sort of quiet meditation on ordinary life. There's no supernatural, there's no fantasy, there's no um, you know, engagement with the paranormal. It is really just a man going for a walk. It's really an extraordinary exploration of this way in which a character can be a story can be driven by very, very little. Female characters are now very powerful, very compelling. Here is a Western called Emerald by Samura Hiroki. And what's really incredible about this comic is the artistry and the way it's framed. And the story is a, a kind of one-off, but it's just wonderfully dramatic. And it has this incredible dramatic push all the way to the finish. It's just amazing framing and the setup. And it's just one surprise after another. It's just a really exquisite comic, beautifully done. So let's talk about the way in which women are res largely responsible for these changes in manga, the diversity of genres, the complexity of female characters, the nuance and subtlety of the page layouts. All of this is really due to the kind of work that was done by women. Now, women didn't start women's comics. There have been a few fledgling stories, which nobody really found very interesting. Girls were often, you know, portrayed in a fairly humble and submissive way. It wasn't until Osama Tezuka took on the idea of girls' comics. And to do that, he really had to create a character that was, well, more like a boy. And to do that, he created Princess Knight, this girl who is reared like a boy, and she's not afraid to go out and, and have an adventure. And this sort of mixing up of the genres and roles is proved hugely popular. So Osama Tezuka not only invented boys' manga, he really set the direction for a lot of girls' manga as well, allowing this, the genre of our girls to expand in new and surprising ways. Princess Knight, disguised as a boy, going out on an adventure. It's really fun, and of course, it's very adorable and very cute. 
But there's a level of adventure here, a level of excitement that just really wasn't possible in girls' comics before Osama Tezuka. So in shoujo manga, we see the first time a woman actually gets to draw women's comics is 1964. Machiko Satonata was one of the first, and she was the first one to create girl characters that were a little bit more expansive in speaking to the fears and desires of girls. And it's, this is really extraordinary. If you think about today, 70% of all mangakas, that is people who make manga, are women. I mean, that's just incredible. So even though the vast majority of manga are read and consumed by men, the vast majority of the comics are being made by women. Here's a really important distinction, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of the cute and the beautiful. And often in girls' comics, there is this sort of rivalry between the cute heroine, who is the hero of our story, and the stunningly beautiful, the Urutsukushi. And the stunningly beautiful has, of course, these powers because she is beautiful. People fall over themselves and offer her every kind of possible opportunity. Whereas the cute girl can't rely on that. She must depend on her wit. She must depend on her being resourceful and resilient. And so there's a sort of rivalry between these two. They're both vying for some position in society. But in a way, they admire each other, both for their innate abilities and their skills. And you see that duality here played out in many, many different forms. One of the big early hits that was a massive crossover was Ryoko Ikeda's The Rose of Versailles. And this was an enormously popular story, again, following in this idea of a girl who is reared as a boy, uh, disguised as Oscar, and this sort of historical drama and romance as it sort of plays out among these women who are infatuated with um, this woman dressed as a man. And so The Rose of Versailles was one of those stories that was a huge breakout hit, and it was created into a stage play. And you see the stage play poster here. Both of the characters here uh, are performed by women. And that is a, an important feature in the Takarazuka theater troops in Japan. All the roles are played by women. It's sort of in opposition to the traditional kabuki theater where all the roles are played by men. Takarazuka has its own theater training. It does Western musicals. They do all kinds of things. And interestingly enough, it's been around for quite a long time. The cartoon artist Osama Tezuka grew up in the region of Takarazuka, and he went to these productions often. So it's interesting that he would take on that idea of a girl dressed up as a man. Another very important comic artist in Japan is Moto Hagio, who is one of several mangaka who became known as the Magnificent 49ers, because in the, they were all born uh, shortly after World War II, and they were raised on manga. And they really pushed manga in really stunning new directions. We see in Moto Hagio's work this much more emotional world, the way in which the frames break and the way in which the characters interact. And there's a kind of emotional intensity to the relationships. And the first early explorations of homosexual love is depicted in these manga made by women. So she was awarded the Soga Kwan Comics Award in 1976 for her science fiction class, and then there were 11. And uh, she also is the uh, creator of the manga I uh, offered you as a chance to read, Hanshin, the Half-God, so you get a chance to see how she very subtly plays off 
expectations of beauty and the cute, and and how this this story told by the other twin, and that sense of kind of reconciling yourself to this world, this living a life without your conjoined twin. The new genre of girls' comics, girls' manga, has really explored this very environmental world where the frames break apart, fragment, and we see this very impressionistic, emotional series of vignettes that give us a sense of the turmoil and the emotional drama that is underscoring the tale. And the women's comics were really pushing for this exploration of richer, more stronger female characters, richer emotional life. A lot of these are, this is set in a French boarding school in the 1880s. And one of the things I need to point out, the, the idea of homosexual love in girls' comics, is not really that the girls themselves have these fantasies of being homosexual themselves. It's that the homosexual relationship is one that, in their estimation, has greater purity, more innocence. It's not fraught with relationships between genders in Japan are very fraught. They're very tense. There is a lot of anxiety and a lot of turmoil between the expectations of the way mixed-gendered relationships should be. And so homosexual relationships are explored in a lot of women's and girls' manga because they represent a kind of innocence. They represent a kind of purity that other relationships do not have. Here we see in this manga about two police officers in New York. They are falling in love. And you see this intimacy through the way in which the panels and you know, fragment, and we see them looking into each other's eyes. The number of subjects that are taken up in manga are always astounded me. I'm, uh, Swing Shell by Yuka Suno is a really an astounding one-off comic by a tremendous artist who's willing to explore in a very poetic way the turmoils of abuse that a father perpetrates on her daughter. And even though you don't see it directly, you see the results of it. We see her bandaged up. We see her bruised. We see her next to this sleeping bear. And she rows herself out at the end of the comic into this ocean between this fine line. And I think this is a really extraordinary comic. It doesn't try and reconcile the conflict. It doesn't try and say this is the solution. It merely is allowing us to sit with the idea that these things and poisonous and toxic relationships like this do exist. One of the ways in which women have been able to enter into the manga world is through self-published fan manga. There's a huge convention called Komiket, started in 1975, where people come and they get a table and they people rush in and buy up their self-published magazines. There is a, a parody of all kinds of popular genres and popular stories. People spend a great deal of time kind of finding out what audiences want. And so there's the parody of the pretty boy genre, and there's a, pretty, a parody of the pretty girl genre. And there's this massive comic uh, catalog of this conference, which is 1,400 pages long. Each of the pages you can see, there are literally dozens and dozens of manga, uh, self-published manga to choose from. And it, this convention is so popular, it's now held twice a year. One, the major event, and then a smaller event. And then satellite events have begun to pop up all over Japan. Dojinchi magazines um, are the sort of self-published magazine. And it's a three-day event, these, these conventions. Over a half million visitors arrive twice a year. 
fan of manga are much more outrageous creations. And this is where a lot of the innovation where of manga is fermenting. It's not in the big publishers, you know, in the in the mainstream. It's this drive to innovate and this desire to be discovered that you see this massive outpouring of self-published manga. One group that has emerged from Kamaket and has proved enduringly popular are this the group that calls itself Clamp. And these uh, four women, uh, some of them have gone on to have careers of their own, and uh, you see they've done a number of really stellar different manga, a variety of different s- styles. Clamp not only does the sort of cute designs, more historic romances, but also the sort of noir version, one called XX Holic, which was a really fascinating manga about addiction and how this sort of vampy character helps people deal with their addictions by forcing them to surrender something that is valuable to them, in a sense, to overcome your addiction. It's actually, even though the story is fairly sensational, there's some very solid advice that you can get on in this manga about addiction. And it deals with all kinds of addiction, including addiction to computers. As we see in this one here, uh, she doesn't quite know how to overcome her addiction to computers. And she's given some advice. Here's another example of sort of the art of shoju manga, Kuroyu Shure Alt Chino. It's a very sort of cryptic, enigmatic comic. Deals a lot with, again, emotions and, really, and fashions. This amazing outpouring of panels. And you see these sort of large eyes and sort of looking into space. I just want to point out in the center there, you see this circle within a circle, and there's a series of dots coming down the forehead there. Those dots actually represent the idea of ellipses. And you'll see that a lot in women's comics, the ellipses, that sort of a space for where there is a thought, but there are no words to describe the thought that is happening. You see a lot of sort of surreal imagery that comes into uh, these emotional dreamscapes, incredible tableaus and textures and fashions all become uh, the, the main vocabulary of women's comics. In the United States, the first manga to arrive were boys' manga, and it was the manga Akira, which by Kachu Hiro Otomo, um, that became the first to be really widely disseminated, enormously popular. When we look at Otomo's work, you can see he's got an incredible way of rendering technology and cityscapes and this incredible energy that drives through these speed lines and the action between these biker gangs that are battling it out in the streets of Neo-Tokyo. So it's a very, very dramatic manga with a lot of violence and action. And I'll show you it's really interesting how things translate in manga. Notice how where the characters are of the sounds of the characters, especially in the lower panel, you can get an idea. Now, when you translate this into English, it kind of changes the character of the Japanese that is used The katagana, that is the the kind of angular characters that are used to to write the sound effects, kind of fit into the landscape. Whereas the English words sort of hover on the surface of the manga. You see the glang and vroom and rack, all those are, are on the surface of the page. And so sound effects have this sort of tension in English with the visual character of the comic. That it doesn't quite happen the same way in manga. 
So when Akira first appeared in the United States, it was one of the first manga to be translated. And it was a huge undertaking. They had to digitize every page. And they didn't think that Americans would read a comic that wasn't in color. And so they spent an enormous amount of time translating not just the sound effects and the language, but every panel into brilliant color. And then they had to reverse every pay panel and the order of all the panels and get, make it so they would read from left to right like it should in English. Of course, we've learned now that American audiences kind of like the black and white manga, and they're willing to read manga essentially backwards. As long as the words are in English, most people are comfortable figuring out how to read manga in the way it was intended. And that has allowed for a huge outpouring of new manga translations. So the, the movie Akira came out in 1987, it, it, originally in Japan and in the U.S. in 2001, and it was a major hit. And starting in 2001, we start to see more and more manga translated in the United States and more Japanese anime in the United States. So here you can see some other examples of translation strategies. Most of the time today, you often see no attempt to translate the Japanese. Or in the case here on the right, there's actually a whole uh, index in the back where if you count the number of panels, it'll they have translated there for you the what is actually happening in the sound effects. So it sort of translates, you know, boon means vush. And so there's different sound effects that are sort of translated in the back. Sometimes there's an attempt in action comics to sort of introduce English language sound effects. But they, again, they, they really intrude into the picture much more than Japanese characters do. Or in this case here, you can see how they've stylized the English characters to make them look a little bit like Japanese. It doesn't quite work. And then lastly, you can see here the big sound effect on the lower left um, is translated in tiny words as the, the evil hell baby rips off the kid's head, you can hear the sound of rip is written in the upper portion of the panel. So translating manga is, is really quite an extraordinary skill. It requires a lot of thoughtful reconstruction of the panels so that some features, which are important to the reading sensibility, are translated in a way without intruding on the intrinsic unified visual character of the manga. Now, American comic publishers, DC and Marvel, have both tried to introduce superheroes to Japan with very limited success. Here was the first uh, attempt with Batman in 1966. He was published in Japan, created by a Japanese artist. Uh, but it only ran for about a year, and it was never collected into an anthology. So no matter how important American things were in Japan at this time, superheroes just never really took off. They also, Marvel had uh, Japanese artists create the Hulk and uh, Spider-Man, but neither of these uh, really caught on in any big way. Again, the novelty was about all they had going for them. Even as the Japanese artists who were entrusted with using these characters tried to infuse them with more personal stories, more heartfelt interactions, nothing seemed to really capture the imagination of the Japanese readers. In 2000 and thereafter, there has been uh, an attempt by American publishers to try and tap into this popularity of Japanese manga, again, with very limited success. 
They seem to understand the visual forms of manga, the way the panels work, the sort of samurai like battles. But there's something really missing in the stories. There's something really essentially missing. In the makeup of the characters that prevents them from really capturing what makes manga manga.